Well, hi. Good morning. If you're able, will you stand with us as we begin our service today? Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus And He's never let me down He's faithful through generations so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. And I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus And He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would He fail now? He won't He won't, he won't fail, he won't fail, he won't, he won't, he won't fail, he won't fail. is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus and he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't He won't He won't fail He won't fail Is built on you. 
Christ is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus cause he's never let me down he's faithful through generations so why were he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. No, he won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. Amen. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Ann. I want to welcome you to Dallas Church this morning. If you're new with us, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We have a booth in the lobby that we'd love for you to stop by. We'd like to get to know you a little bit. One of our team members will be there. And if you're new online, drop a message into the chat feature so that your host can reach out to you. Today we are continuing in our series on the tales of the kingdom, and we get to hear from David Bessenbacher this morning, so we're looking forward to that. Let's say a prayer, and then we'll continue our gathering this morning. Lord, we thank you so much that we get to be here with you this morning. Lord, surrounded by people who love you, I pray that you would help us all to just be able to be present this morning, Lord, to be able to be open and vulnerable with you, and Lord, to be open to what you have to say. In your name we pray. Amen. I've never known a love like yours. So intimate, so powerful. I've tasted I've seen nothing comes close. I've never known a love like yours. Jesus, your name is power, it's breath and living water. Your spirit guides me to the heart of a father. Let your praise ring louder. Every day and every hour, your spirit guides me to the heart of a father. I've never felt at home like this, just like a child so innocent. But I'm safe inside your arms. Cause you won't let go I've never known a love like yours Jesus, your name is power It's breath and living water Your spirit guides me To the heart of a father Let your praise ring louder Every day and every hour your spirit guides me to the heart of a father. Sing praise. We sing praise. We sing praise. We sing praise. Jesus, your name 
this power and spread the living water. Your spirit guides me to the heart of a father. Let your praise ring louder every day and every hour. Your spirit guides me to the heart of a father. Jesus, your name is power. It's breath of living water. Your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. Let your praise ring louder every day and every hour. Your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. Sing praise. We sing praise. the greatest player to ever play the game of basketball. I haven't even told you much yet, and you probably already have an idea of who I'm talking about. You might not like basketball, have ever watched a game, or even care to, but likely when I say his name, you will recognize it. From 1991 to 1998, he led his team to win six NBA championship titles. And the case could probably be made that if he didn't go play baseball for a couple of years, they would have won eight years in a row. But before Michael Jordan led his team to win three NBA championships in a row, not once, but twice, his coach Phil Jackson pulled him aside and had a crucial conversation with him. Because since entering the NBA in 1984, Michael Jordan had always been a great player. Leading up to that 1991 season, he held five of those years as the top scoring NBA average. But the Chicago Bulls franchise had yet to win a championship title. And so Phil Jackson pulled Michael Jordan aside and had a conversation that went something maybe a little bit like this. Michael, everyone can tell you're a great player. In fact, maybe the best. The spotlight is on you right now. But I can tell you're playing for Michael Jordan to be great. And if we want to win championships, I need you to buy into this team. I need you to buy into my coaching and my system of training. And I need you to take the spotlight off of yourself and put it on some of your teammates. And then, we will win championships and truly be great together. Growing up in the 90s, I loved basketball. I loved watching it. I loved playing it. I loved playing games about playing it. You could often <laughs> find me out on the uh, courtyard with, shooting hoops with some friends or one-on-one -on -one or even by myself if I had to, shooting free throws, three-pointers. And Michael Jordan was one of my all-time favorites. Anybody remember that commercial, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be like Mike? Well, that was me, and uh, except for the year that he beat the Portland Trailblazers in the championship, I think in 1992. But other than that, I was inspired. I even thought that one day I could play in the NBA. I mean, obviously, I have the height and the physical attributes for it. Uh, I was pretty good, though. I could shoot free throws and three-pointers, and I could usually out-hustle my competition. Uh, you know, I was a legend in my own mind, really. <clears throat> but uh, one, one year, going into my sophomore year, I get challenged to play this one-on-one -on -one game with, uh, I think, a seventh grader. To me, he was just a little kid, so I should have been able to beat him no problem. Well, I think we were going to play to 15, and I got served up the biggest slice of humble pie. I couldn't score on him. I couldn't uh, 
out hustle him. I couldn't defend him. I think by the end of it, it was like 3 to 15, and we did this a couple times. But by the time it was all over, I was completely demoralized. All my faith of ever playing at a professional level, all my hopes and dreams crushed in that one single moment to ever play in the NBA. And I know you feel sorry for me. <laughs> but there's something in us, isn't there? This desire to be great, to be competitive. It could be in a sport or maybe in a career or some other area of life. It could just be with a board game with your family or friends and you just have to win. But uh, we tend to look around, we gauge who the best is, and then we try to be just a little bit better. And maybe some of that's okay if it's causing some honest competition and it's helping both of us be better or the group or organization as a whole to be better. But if it's causing us to tear each other down, if it's causing envy, bitterness, or strife, if somehow it makes us think we're above others and that we're more deserving, then it's probably not healthy for us or for those around us. And depending on who or what you put your faith in <clears throat> and how we perceive status and greatness, it will reflect on how we see ourselves and it will have an impact on how we treat and interact with others our willingness to confront issues, and then even our ability to forgive and reconcile with those around us. Hi, my name is David Bessenbacher. Uh, great to be here with you this morning as we continue through our series in Matthew, uh, what we call Tales of the Kingdom. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 17 and 18 today, kind of a large section of scripture that I'm going to just breeze through and hopefully narrow in on just a couple of key points. We're going to see uh, Jesus coming down off the mountain where we witnessed the transfiguration. He's going to be going back into Galilee and Capernaum to do some miracles and to teach. And I think what we're going to see in this passage is Jesus is doing these miraculous things, is that he's asking his disciples to partner with him in a new kingdom, in a new way to be human. That he wants them to put all their hope, their faith, and their trust in him. That they are children of the kingdom, and they want, he wants them to be humble and forgiving like him. But we're going to see that we as people tend to struggle with faith, status, and forgiveness. And Jesus is calling us into a new way to live and a new way to be human and a kingdom that he has brought to us and he wants us to share it with others. Let's pray. Most kind Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we're just so grateful to be gathered here together today in fellowship to lift up the name of Jesus. We're so thankful that Jesus modeled faith, humility, and forgiveness. Lord, help us to be a people who follows the example of Jesus, and that Jesus may get all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we uh, open up to Matthew chapter 17, starting with verse 14, we see Jesus coming down off the mountain where Peter, James, and John just witnessed and experienced this amazing event where Jesus' glory is revealed to them. There's Moses there who represents the law and Elijah who represents the prophets. And then a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, hear him. And then as they're coming down off the mountain, there's a large crowd and a man comes up to Jesus and falls down and says, Lord, please help me. My son, he's suffering from seizures. He's often falling into water, into fire. Uh, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't do anything to help them, help him. Please, Lord, have mercy on my son. And Jesus, after giving a little bit of a rebuke about a faithless generation and how long am I going to be with you, he casts out the demon from the boy and heals him. And then the disciples come up a little bit later <clears throat> in private and say, well, why couldn't we do this? And he tells him this in uh, verse uh, 20 of 17. Because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. 
So we see Jesus is calling his disciples to be a people of faith. That if they even have just a little seed of faith, they will be able to do things beyond their imagination. And then as they gather back in Galilee, he starts to tell them again, look, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. He's going to be killed, but he will be raised again on the third day. And the disciples, it says they were greatly distressed. They weren't really understanding the whole plan that was being laid out before them. And as they get into Capernaum, uh, there's some collectors of the temple tax. They, uh, the temple tax was a tax that every Jewish male over a certain age was supposed to pay to help benefit and upkeep the temple. Well, they come up to Peter and say, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And Peter, good old Peter, says, well, of course he does. And then maybe walk in to find Jesus, uh, does he? And when he gets into the house where Jesus is, Jesus actually speaks first and says, What do you think, Simon? From who do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when Peter said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open his mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. So we see Jesus has authority over even the temple. That he's, the disciples are seeing their status in this kingdom. And then often that comes up with the disciples, they ask Jesus, well, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And the Gospels of Math are Mark and Luke actually tell us that uh, they were arguing among themselves which of them was the greatest. And so Jesus, perceiving their hearts, you would have thought Jesus might have been like, well, I'm the greatest, but he doesn't. Yeah. He, he, he takes a little child and he brings it among them and he starts giving them this teaching in uh, 18, looking at verse 3. Truly, I say to you, unless you churn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Buckle up. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one, one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. So kind of a... a Tough teaching here, but remember there's a little child still right there among them. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Remember, that was the point, to gain your brother. Not to figure out how to push him out or ostracize him or push him down, but to bring him back in. But Jesus goes on, But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. 
So some pretty amazing stuff happening in this section of Scripture. And maybe the disciples are contemplating the last few days as Jesus brings this child among them and he starts dishing them up uh, some humble pie. And they're, maybe they're scratching their head thinking, well, what does it mean to live in this new way? Because on one hand, Jesus is telling them, you need to be this people of great faith. And the reason that you can't do certain healings or miracles is because you're lacking faith. And you don't understand who you are or what you've been called to do. And if you just had a little seed of faith, you would be able to do things seemingly beyond your imagination. You would be able to do the impossible. And then this idea with the temple tax, that they're children, sons of the kingdom, so they shouldn't have to pay that tax. But not to give offense, go ahead and pay it this time. So we see this balancing that maybe just when the disciples are thinking they are something special, Jesus brings in this child among them and he starts giving them this teaching on humility is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so we see that God desires a close relationship with his followers based on faith, humility, and forgiveness. That yes, God wants a people of great faith, but not for their own greatness or status. He wants a people humble and forgiving. God wants us to be accepting of people into his kingdom and not leading them astray or into sin. God has love and compassion for the individual. He doesn't wish that any of his children should perish and that he rejoices over even one of the lost that is found. And he wants his people to be forgiving and seek reconciliation with each other when at all possible. And as people, we tend to struggle with faith, status, and forgiveness. We often have preconceptions about what greatness and status really even is. And we often lack the faith that God has called us and the work he's called us to do if we don't stay close to Jesus. And so we need to stay close to him and not get caught up in who is the greatest or who is the best. We should be looking inward and trying to push out or cut out our sin entirely as Jesus was pointing out. And that we should be grateful for the opportunity to get into the kingdom of heaven no matter what our status. That we should be a people forgiving like God is forgiving. And we should approach those who we have an issue with with the intent to restore them back into fellowship. As we're looking at this passage in Matthew and what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to understand is that yes, God wants a people of great faith in him and his plan. That God's kingdom is for the humble. And yes, we should be ambassadors of truth and confront issues within ourselves or even within others, but it should be for the purpose of forgiveness and reconciliation to bring those lost or astray back into the kingdom of God and welcome them as brothers and sisters. We should be asking ourselves how we should live based on Jesus' example and teaching. First off, we should be aware of our own tendency to lack faith. As we look around this world, it's easy for us to get beaten down and influenced by uh, what's possible, what's not possible, Maybe we get distracted and start to see other things as a priority. Then maybe we start to disengage and we start to forget God's promises and the many miraculous things and blessings he's done in our lives and in the lives of others. And maybe we start to doubt. Maybe we wouldn't go so far to say we doubt the existence of God, but by our very actions, we are doubting the power of God. And so to overcome a doubt that leads to a lack of faith, we need to stay in close relationship with Jesus. We can do that by implementing some healthy rhythms in our life. Not for the purpose to puff ourselves up or make us think that we're better or more educated than others, but to give us nourishment, the nourishment we need to serve others and move forward with what God has called us to do. 
First, we can read and study the words that have been given to us and contemplate them and meditate on them. We can be people of extraordinary prayer, that prayer isn't something that we just do as a religious act, but a way that we prioritize and focus in on our relationship and communication with God, a God that we remember loves us, has grace and mercy for us, and he listens to our requests and wants good things for his children. Another way we can overcome a lack of faith is by fellowship. We can encourage each other. We can pray with each other. We can study in God's word together and build each other up. I believe God will show up in big ways, maybe in some ways that some of us have never even imagined, in ways of comfort, in ways of wisdom and guidance, in ways of healing, maybe physically, but maybe even more importantly, spiritually and emotionally. So right now, maybe take a personal account. And if you've been feeling any doubt or just a lack of faith, check yourself. How are you doing on these rhythms? How are you doing at being in God's word? How are you doing with prayer? Is it a priority or just an afterthought? And how are you doing when it comes to being in community with fellow believers? Is this just a Sunday activity or look around, is this family? As for our status in the kingdom of heaven, we should realize that we are blessed beyond measure. Some of the disciples got into their head this idea of which of them was the greatest. And Jesus flips this on his head and says, unless you even humble yourself like a little child, you're not even getting in. But those who do humble themselves as a child, they are the greatest. I don't know if you caught that or not, not who is the greatest, but the whosoever that humbles themselves, they are the greatest. And whoever receives the humble childlike in the name of Jesus receives Jesus. And as we probably all know, there's a difference between being childish and being childlike. And in that moment, the disciples were being and acting childish. God's kingdom is for the humble. So are we being childish or childlike in our faith, our attitude, and our actions toward God and others? Childish faith might be argumentative, self-centered, boastful, using a position for advantage, maybe even bullying, competing for the hierarchy at any, any cost, getting what I want, when I want, the way I want, and if I don't get it, you're going to hear about it or I'm going somewhere else. Childlike faith, on the other hand, is going to be trusting, teachable, asking questions with a heart humble in our beliefs and interactions, not worried about status or how I can gain from a situation, but working from a sincere heart with innocence and purity and motives, serving and seeking unity with each other. Is our faith and our actions leading people to Jesus or further away from Jesus? And maybe we need to get humble with ourselves and ask forgiveness if we are creating a stumbling block to Jesus for ourselves or even for others. We need to deal with our own heart when it comes to our own struggle to sin, our own lack of faith and how we see status and greatness, and how it reflects our relationships around us. And as we are forgiven and reconciled to God through Jesus, maybe the first person you need to forgive and reconcile with is yourself. Because to be a forgiving person, we need to live as forgiven people. Jesus forgave it all. He paid it all. And now you and I are his ambassadors to reconcile people back to God and to each other. The Apostle Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, looking at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, 
not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Maybe the idea that we need to wrestle with today is the same thing the disciples at the time were wrestling with. Is my interest in Jesus and what he can do for me, the great things that I can do and accomplish, my status, my greatness, my glory, to elevate myself above others and push others down? Or do I truly realize who Jesus is, the kingdom and the life that he brings through faith, humility, and forgiveness, reconciling us and even partnering with us into a new life and a new way to be human. Have faith, understand who you are in Jesus and his kingdom, but be humble. And maybe similar to what Phil Jackson told Michael Jordan, you need to have a crucial conversation with yourself and hear something like this. Everyone can see you're doing great and the best you can do for yourself. But right now, it's evident that you're playing for your best self. But if we truly want to see God's kingdom here on earth, I need you to buy into the mission. I need you to love and edify your fellow brothers and sisters around you and work for forgiveness and reconciliation. I need you to humble yourself and put all your faith and hope in Jesus and follow his ways. And then we will truly see the fruits of God's kingdom on earth as we do in heaven. Let's pray. Most kind Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for Jesus. We thank, we're thankful that he modeled uh, faith, humility, and forgiveness. Lord, help us to be a people who are forgiving like Jesus is forgiving. Help us to go out into the world and share Jesus' example. We thank you for his love, his grace, and his mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, David. This is the time in our service that we uh, devote to giving and to communion. If you'd like to support the ministry of Dallas Church, you can do so in the boxes up front or on the Church Center app or online or in the P.O. box. In about a minute here, we're going to invite you to come up and take, the commun take communion with us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he had a meal with his friends and followers, and he took bread and he said, take this, this is my body, remember. Um, he took wine and they drank, and he said, drink this, this is my blood. Um, and when we take communion, we're remembering the work that he did for us on the cross. We're remembering the lives he's called us to live, and we're remembering the church that he's asked us to be. So we invite you now to take communion with us.
thank you that you love us. We thank you that you desire to have a relationship with us. God, we thank you that you earnestly seek after us. God, it is so amazing. It is so incredible. Lord, there is nobody like you. There is no one like you. You are the name above all names. You are the king of all kings. We thank you, Jesus. touch my heart like you do and I could search for all eternity long and find there's none like you there's none like you no one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there's none like you. None like you. None like you. Not a one like you.
safe in your arms. search for all eternity long and find there is none like you there is none like you no one else can touch my heart like you do I could search for all eternity long and find there's none like you. And I could search for all eternity long and find there's none like you. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. We live for you. So holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. Wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Yeah. Worthy of every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you We live for you So holy There is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart and in me in your love to those around me and I will build my life up 
Thanks for being with us today. Again, if you're new with us, let us know you were here, whether that's here in person or online through the chat feature, we would love to connect with you. Before we head out today, I want to turn our attention towards some things we have going on this summer. The first I want to draw your attention to is the Crazy Days Parade. Our church will be participating in that, so we encourage you to come and walk with us. It's always really fun every year. We get to spend time together, but then we also get to reach out to our community and just show our love for our town. And then the week after that, we are having a block party. So some of you may remember we did this last year and it was so much fun. It was inspired by one of the series that we did called The Art of Neighboring, based on a book that a lot of us read. And so it's just a really awesome opportunity for us to have fellowship with each other, but then also reach out to the families that are physically around our church building. So I encourage you guys to make time and space on your calendar for those two really fun events. And with that, let's go out this week and be the church to our community. I will build my life. Oh.